My name is Joseph McIntyre. I'm a podiatry lecturer here at Queen Margaret University. Um, I'm going to be looking at rheumatology um, in relation to your module in medicine and pathology as part of your MSc. And we're going to look at two main lectures, and the first one being around osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. The content of this lecture is largely split into two, with the first half looking at osteoarthritis um, and what the latest evidence is telling us around this pathology. And the second half is going to be the same, but we're going to focus on rheumatoid arthritis and what the current evidence is saying um, about the pathology and management of that condition. Before launching into condition-specific discussion, I thought it was important just to take some time to have a think about terminology, which is really important if you are working or researching um, within the world of rheumatology or MSK generally. Um, I won't go through this slide word for word at the moment, but I would encourage you to have a look at this, because knowing your terminology in this area is particularly important um, for effective patient management and for effective communication with the wider multidisciplinary team and ensuring that you are using the correct terminology to outline appropriate diagnosis and care planning. Again, before we start looking at abnormal, I think it's good to just have a, a bit of a refresher on normal and what normal joints should look and function like. Um, I've put in a bit of a diagram here just for those who are maybe a bit more visual, but the next slide we are going to go on and look at joints in a bit more detail and what makes up the normal healthy joint. If we think back to general anatomy and MSK anatomy, obviously there's more than one type of joint, but what we are largely going to be concerned about today and within this lecture is synovial joints, which are our peripheral weight-bearing functional joints that make up a lot of our MSK system and are the joints that are largely affected by osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. So there are various different components of a synovial joint that have to be present and functioning appropriately to maintain homeostasis and good function of the joint. Obviously, if we look from deep to superficial, we start off with bone, which is one of the main components of a synovial joint. It's highly vascular and com composed of mineralized collagen. Covering the ends of the, the long bones is then a articular cartilage which acts to shock absorb and maintain normal um, joint function and protect the underlying um, subchondral bone. It is avascular and nourished, nourished largely from synovial fluid. It's composed of type 2 collagen proteoglycans which keep cartilage hydrated and chondrocytes which secrete collagen and proteoglycans which is important for cartilage turnover and renewal. We then have the synovial lining of the joint which secretes the synovial fluid. So the synovial membrane lines the joint capsule which is attached to the periosteum adjacent bone. Um, involved in that layer are things like macrophages and fibroblast-like synovial sites. Um, synovial sites secrete hyaluron into the joint space which contains glycoprotein reducing friction within the joint surface. Synovium, as well as being in synovial joint, also um, lines um, tendon where they pass over anatomical structures like bone for example around the ankle joint and also bursa which is one of the reasons why um, rheumatoid arthritis can affect articular and extra articular structures which we'll go on to look at in the second half of this discussion. We then again get more superficial we have ligaments and tendons which speak for themselves they are there to stabilize the joint and initiate movement um, of, of, of your limbs and are important for just general MSK function day to day. We then have blood vessels and nerves, again, which, which innervate and supply the, the joints with sensation, movement, um, nutrients, um, and, and all of which is involved with those. And then we move on to the biochemical mediators, which are present in normal synovial joints, so things like agrippinase and metalloproteinases, or MMPs for short, which repair and remodel connective tissue and are vital in maintaining um, good joint integrity. We then have cytokines such as IL-1 secreted by chondrocytes which um, promote collagen turnover and inhibitors, um, tissue inhibitor of 
MMP and plasminogen activator inhibitor 1. Um, these molecules inhibit degradation of connective tissue. So uh, these factors all work together to create a balance in terms of breakdown, turnover and repair of the joint structures to keep the joint structures healthy and functioning. And then we've obviously got the skeletal muscles, um, myocytes containing actin and myosin molecules, which are part of a somatic motor innovation and in allowing us to move via the joints and function day to day. So we're now going to go on to look at osteoarthritis specifically and what the, the current evidence is telling us around this condition. So important to start at what, what exactly is this condition and most of you, or if not all of you, will have obviously come across this um, routinely in general practice. It is the most common presentation of arthritis. Um, historically and, and even now we, we quite often describe osteoarthritis as just wear and tear and I think it's important to, to just highlight right from um, the start that it isn't just wear and tear and we're going to have a wee look at that in more detail in terms of the pathophysiology of this condition. It is thought to have biochemical, genetic and metabolic and biomechanical factors and obviously some of the main features we know of osteoarthritis are loss of cartilage, subchondral bone trauma, bone remodelling and inflammation and that, I think that's important. We always think of osteo-rheumatoid arthritis, one being inflammatory arthritis, one not. However, that, that's not entirely true and we'll look at um, where inflammation is involved in osteoarthritis and what the evidence tells us on that. So the etiology of osteoarthritis is obviously multifactorial. There's no one thing that causes the presentation of this condition. It is definitely about multiple factors and we see some of them um, in the patients that we work with daily. So <coughs> things that can be modifiable, modifiable and things that are non-modifiable. So if you look at the modifiable um, factors that relate to osteoarthritis, things like weight and obesity, and we're going to look at that in more detail, lack of exercise and physical activity, mechanical and indeed biomechanical factors, which we'll obviously think about as podiatrists, and management of other diseases which contribute um, to secondary osteoarthritis, and non-modifiable factors, things like age, sex and genetics, and again we're going to look at all those in a little bit more detail. So the signs and symptoms, if we consider them um, with osteoarthritis, you, you'll probably see these regularly as part of your clinical practice, but the signs are obviously associated with advancing age and female um, sex predisposition, reduced function um, of not just the joint but of the person themselves, so looking not just at the joint but at the patient as a whole, there will definitely be a reduction potentially in function depending on the stage and presentation of the osteoarthritis, a reduction in the range and quality of the joint movement, muscle weakness and atrophy, obviously due to disuse, guarding, protecting the joint, if something is painful you don't want to use it as much and therefore um, the muscles that had an impact on other structures surrounding the joint as well as intra-articularly what's going on in terms of the pathology, deformity, um, which we're going to look at, um, I have a few images on upcoming slides, um, and that can happen in various locations throughout the body. And limitation of systemic signs and symptoms. So unlike rheumatoid arthritis where we can sometimes take blood and look at other things, that there is a lack of further investigations that would highlight um, similar features in osteoarthritis out with your, your general medical imaging and clinical presentation. In terms of the symptoms, that will vary widely between patients and, and who this condition affects, but some of the more common ones, joint pain worsened by exercise, relieved by rest, which is in contrast to some of the inflammatory arthropathies we'll look at, impact on quality of life and reduced function, secondary pain sites due to compensation, obviously if one area is sore, it's a basic law mechanically that you will then try and offload that and that will increase the tissue stress somewhere else, which is something we see regularly if we're working in MSK practice. And chronic pain presentation, um, 
the presentation of pain and dysfunction extends out with just the joint and the pathology itself, particularly in instances of chronic pain. So again, I've just put in a few um, diagrammatic versions of what we've just discussed. Again, just for those who are, are a bit more visual in terms of the learning and use, will be things that you have probably come across in practice. Um, so if we have a look at each of those, we've got Heberin's nodes at the top left, which is um, a presentation of osteoarthritis affecting the distal interphalangeal joint of the fingers. We then have Butcher's nodes, which is similar, but affecting the proximal interphalangeal joint. And then we've got a presentation in terms of the foot and ankle that we see quite often in terms of dorsal osteopathic lipping at the first MTPJ. And these are all features of that kind of hyperostotic bony proliferation that is associated with osteoarthritis. <coughs> so in terms of the diagnosis, largely osteoarthritis is diagnosed clinically um, and just based on clinical examination and signs and symptoms, but obviously um, we can do further investigation if needed. So the clinical manifestation and, and what we would look for in terms of a diagnosis is pain and crepitus and loss of movement on joint assessment, weakness on resisted and functional assessment of the joint and surrounding structures in terms of the, the, the muscle function, deformity, which we've just had a look at, um, mid and end range pain and, and feel of a joint. Um, so that will tell you a bit about severity in terms of if it's extremely painful even on mid-range movement, then potentially suggesting more advanced disease. You also look for the end range and the, the feel of the end range to tell you if the limitation in the joint is obviously due to an arthritic component and a capsular component or is it extra capsular. Um, obviously advancing age, we've, we've spoke about that previously, and morning stiffness of less than 30 minutes. And I think that's really important to highlight because that's quite different um, in more inflammatory presentations of arthritis, which we'll look at in the second half. Further investigations that you might want to consider, usually it would just be x-ray for osteoarthritis, which is certainly first line, although it might not show early changes, especially in the foot. Um, later stages, we would expect things like joint space loss, subchondral sclerosis and cysts, and osteophyte formation as the um, repair process tries to heal what's going on, but is unsuccessful at doing so, and may also demonstrate deformity and periarticular soft tissue swelling. <coughs> Other options that we have <coughs> include MRI, which will demonstrate um, pathological changes of osteoarthritis certainly earlier than other um, imaging options. It will demonstrate earlier signs of subchondral bone edema, which isn't specific for osteoarthritis but can to then. Also shows synovial thickening, cartilage loss, soft tissue inflammation and bursitis, so it will highlight some of the extra articular features of this pathology as well. Ultrasound can be very useful, particularly I found ultrasound very useful when examining the midfoot for osteoarthritis and differentiating between inflammatory and non-inflammatory pathology. Um, whilst ultrasound doesn't readily identify and allow you to examine bone as good as X-ray, certainly in terms of the outer cortical aspect of the bone and joint, it will allow um, good evaluation of that and the presentation or not of inflammation. So ultrasound can be very useful. It can also be useful not just diagnostically but therapeutically in terms of guiding injections. Again, in areas like the midfoot work are a bit more difficult to do blind. Blood work in osteoarthritis is usually normal, although high sensitivity CRP may be raised, but um, is probably of limited value routinely um, as part of the investigation for this particular pathology. And aspiration, obviously if other types of arthritis are suspected, then it might be important or prudent to aspirate the joint. Um, I, I don't envisage that this will be something routinely done in osteoarthritis, however it is an option if other arthropathies are suspected. So if we go on and look at the medical imaging in osteoarthritis, and I've put up a few slides of X-rays, MRI and, and ultrasound, um, X-ray is obviously your main port of call, it is first line, but I think as well as looking at some of the features that we've discussed and that we see regularly, I think it's really important when considering any medical imaging, um, with any condition but with arthritic presentation, 
is to go back to that evidence around the biopsychosocial model because imaging severity or lack of does not always correlate with the clinical symptoms and presentation. So you could have somebody with very advanced osteoarthritis who has very little impact in terms of pain and in terms of quality of life, whereas you can have somebody with very early um, presentations of osteoarthritis on medical imaging and they present in significant pain, discomfort, with significant loss of function and um, kind of more significant impact in terms of deterioration on quality of life. So everyone is an individual and it's important to consider the whole picture and not just the image in front of you in terms of what's going on. And that comes back to that chronic pain that we mentioned earlier in terms of things like central sensitization and, and what can alter um, the different presentations of osteoarthritis in different people. <coughs> we then move on to MR and we'll see some of the features that we discussed in previous slides in terms of the presentation of osteoarthritis on this imaging modality. And then I put up an ultrasound um, slide which I think is helpful to see how osteoarthritis would present on ultrasound and how we can use ultrasound, particularly as podiatrists within the foot and ankle, to aid us in diagnosis and management. So what we see here is telonavicular osteoarthritis and we see that traditional hyperostotic peaking um, with the two peaks of bone that represent um, osteophytes in the dorsal aspect of the joint and which signify osteoarthritis and we've got minimal inflammatory component um, surrounding that with the use of Doppler which would be typical of an osteoarthritic presentation that would be used for diagnostic purposes as it does look very different from the more catabolic reaction that we would see in rheumatoid arthritis which we're going to go on and look at in the next half of the slide um, and it can also be used for therapeutic purposes in terms of guiding an injection which would be difficult in that joint at the best of times but particularly with those osteophytic peaks making it more difficult to access the joint in the joint space to deposit um, the, the corticosteroid which would be typical in terms of um, treatment for this, for this condition if other measures hadn't been successful. So ultrasound can be very useful, particularly in the foot and ankle. If we look at the pathophysiology of osteoarthritis, in a nutshell, what I always explain in terms of the difference between this and rheumatoid arthritis, a lot of people will, will discuss the inflammatory factors and is there inflammatory factors involved in osteoarthritis and how does that differentiate from rheumatoid arthritis. Absolutely, there is definitely an inflammatory component to osteoarthritis. The way that I will tend to differentiate is I will explain it as osteoarthritis will result in inflammation, whereas rheumatoid arthritis is started by and driven by inflammation. So I think that's an easy way to kind of understand the, the main differences um, between both. <coughs> so if we look at some of the different aspects, and we've already said, said things like cartilage loss, bone destruction, um, deformity, we know that's part of this disease process, but how does that actually happen? So normal cartilage, we looked at earlier in the first slide, <coughs> and this is a balance between degradation and repair. And that depends on cytokines, MMPs, agricanase, and various other factors within, within the joint. In osteoarthritis, this balance is lost. Cartilage becomes edematous and weak because of increased proteoglycan within the area. Focal cartilage erosion is occurred and chondrocytes die. So the cartilage becomes friable and starts to break down. Repair is attempted but is disorganised and the surface of the cartilage becomes fibrillated and fissured. We then, once the cartilage has sustained significant enough damage, we then start impacting on the subchondral underlying bone. So subchondral bone is exposed and subjected to microfractures and cyst development, and that's part of what we see in terms of subchondral cysts on an X-ray. Bone repair is disorganised and sclerotic hyperostosis results at the joint margins and that's why we see and feel things like osteophytic presentations and osteophytes around, for example, the first MTPG at the, at the dorsal aspect. It's a disorganised repair process. 
and inflammation. This occurs due to previous joint damage and, and joint damage processes. It's not the initiator of osteoarthritis, but can perpetuate and then drive the pathology once it is um, induced. We will now look at the issue of osteoarthritis and obesity. Um, historically, clinicians would describe the relationship between osteoarthritis and obesity as one purely of excessive joint loading. And whilst that's part of that clinical picture, it's certainly not all of it. Um, and so we need to be aware of that um, if we are managing and, and discussing this condition with our patients. So, uh, previously thought to be an issue of purely excessive biomechanical load, um, which contributes to the risk and development of osteoarthritis. We now know this is not the full story, so I'm going to have a look at some of the other factors which contribute to the development of osteoarthritis in states of obesity. So yes, initially the excessive loading does inhibit chondrocyte DNA replication, and so essentially inhibits the formation of normal um, articular cartilage. Proteoglycan function is also inhibited and so that normal hydration and maintenance of homeostasis in the, in the cartilage is disrupted and upregulation of MMPs occur and so that degradation of, of cartilage is increased and so that balance of wear, tear and repair of the cartilage in the joint structures is, is lost. Dyslipidemia and obesity raises serum cholesterol. HDLs, which normally clear cholesterol, are lowered, and LDLs are raised, which can cause pro-inflammatory states. So high serum cholesterol is shown to link to osteoarthritis formation because it induces a kind of low-grade inflammation, which is why, if we look at the next point, there is evidence of increased incidence of osteoarthritis and obesity in non-weight-bearing joints, which right away um, discounts the idea that it is purely due to a weight-bearing excess load entity. Um, there are other biochemical factors involved, which some of which we're now outlining. And recent evidence explores the role of fat adipose tissue as an endocrine organ, which in obese states secretes excess adipokine and cytokines which are pro-inflammatory and create basically again that low-grade inflammatory state that we, we've just mentioned which can contribute to a variety of different pathologies throughout the body, osteoarthritis being one of them. In a nutshell, if you contain more fat in your body than you do lean muscle, then it creates a poor physi physiological environment. Um, with things like this starting to occur. If we look at the link to physical activity, obviously physical activity and obesity are very linked and therefore it's going to be linked to um, the formation and risk factor for osteoarthritis. So intermittent joint loading is essential to normal cartilage. So even though in the previous slide we've said that abnormal joint load does inhibit cartilage formation and promotes cartilage degradation, you do need uh, an element of loading to encourage normal wear, tear and repair of cartilage and joint structure. Um, your body very much does have a, if you don't use it, you lose it policy and MSK structures are no exception to that. So movement encourages um, kind of movement of fluid and nutrient between the cartilage and the synovium. Remember we said that cartilage was obviously avascular and so that helps with that process of getting nutrients to the cartilage. And this explains why a lack of physical activity or too much stress affects joints negatively. In addition, muscle strengthening and increase in physical activity have been shown to improve joint function and symptoms in patients with osteoarthritis. So even with the development of the disease, we know that evidence points to physical activity um, reducing pain, improving quality of life, and we know that that can happen even in the absence of any improvement um, in terms of clinical examination or, more importantly, medical imaging. We may not reverse the pathology, but even with the same degree of changes on medical imaging, the use of exercise and physical activity can still positively impact 
on the quality of life and the function of those with osteoarthritis. A question I always get asked in MSK um, is around osteoarthritis and the impact of running. Does it cause osteoarthritis? Does it not cause osteoarthritis? Um, so some of the evidence around this suggests that recreational running is not only good for your overall health, but also benefits your knees and hips. Just 3.5% of runners develop hip or knee arthritis. A uh, sedentary lifestyle not running or competing as an elite runner increases the risk of hip or knee arthritis by 10.2% um, and 13.3% respectively. So essentially what that's shown is around that balance that yes, you do need um, movement and physical activity and to maintain a healthy lifestyle, to maintain homeostasis and good function of the joint, it's more those extreme ends. If you do absolutely nothing or you do way too much, which is sensible in terms of how we think about MSK function and, and normal joint homeostasis and turnover and maintenance of, of the, the components of your synovial joint. So it's about getting that balance right for you as an individual. So the different presentations of osteoarthritis, some of which you may have come across, some of which you may not, um, there is nodular osteoarthritis, which tends to affect postmenopausal women, is associated with an inflammatory phase during which inflammation and enthesitis can be seen on imaging, and usually affects the DIPJs and PIPJs of the hand, and that can lead to some of the deformities that we outlined earlier in terms of Heberden's nodes, Butcher's nodes, and can cause real dysfunction and impact the quality of life, particularly if the hands are involved, um, as obviously we use these so much for day-to-day -day activities. Um, CPPD, calcium pyrophosphate disease, associated with inflammation caused by calcium pyrophosphate crystal deposition in the joint, can lead to chondral calcinosis on X-ray, which I put up an image of, which shows the crystals lining along the articular cartilage. Affects the knees, hips and shoulders largely, but can affect um, multiple joints and present as a polyarthritic presentation. It may be mono, oligo, or, as I've just discussed, polyam presentation depending on the individual and the underlying driver for the chondral calcinosis. And then secondary osteoarthritis and presentation similar can result from the joint damage associated with that condition. In terms of the management of osteoarthritis, obviously that will be different with every individual, and care planning should be different with every individual, but there is some um, main point that we can consider in terms of the management. And if we look at the most recent guideline in terms of the NICE guideline, here are some of the recommendations. I won't read through every statement, but I think it's important to have an awareness of what um, the, the most recent update of the NICE guidelines are suggesting in terms of the management of this condition. If we look at the non-pharmacological management of osteoarthritis, I've split it into um, <coughs> biomedical and biopsychosocial, because I've been speaking throughout this talk about the importance of the biopsychosocial model and consideration of that as well. So the biomedical, largely um, concerned with pain control, um, improving quality of life. Um, so I think the, one of the most important things to look at in osteoarthritis and the presentations of that is, is the pain central? Is it centrally driven if it's more chronic pain and central sensitisation if they've had that for a long time or other, other thing at play? Or is it largely peripheral? Um, you know, is it more of an acute presentation um, with the absence of other factors that would be making you um, consider a more central presentation? Physical activity and exercise and rehab, we are, we've obviously looked at the evidence for those in terms of the undisputed benefit. So it's important to consider these as part of an agreed management and care plan with your patient. Weight loss, again, not just for that biomechanical musculoskeletal overload of the joint, but for the, the biochemical physiological changes that obesity and obese states promote. Surgery, um, so again, depending on the, the joint presentation, the patient, pres patient presentation, and the general health and status of your patient, surgery might be considered if, if more conservative measures have not um, impacted on the treatment of the, the presenting condition. So it, it could be various different surgical options depending on what the presentation is. And acupuncture 
Um, there is actually now some evidence on acupuncture. It's not, it's not historic. And we used to say there was no evidence for it, but now actually there is some evidence for acupuncture in terms of having um, some modest benefits for um, patients with osteoarthritis and particular pain control. If we look at biopsychosocial thoughts, beliefs and behaviour, fear avoidance, catastrophizing, all very, very important in the management of osteoarthritis. Um, and it can take us time as clinicians to <coughs> understand potentially where our role is in this, but certainly um, we, we do, even as podiatrists, have a role in exploring this with our patients because, for example, you know, you may get quite a lot of patients with osteoarthritis through the door that believe if they do any exercise, it is absolutely going to make the pathology and the joint worse, whereas we know that's not true, and that can be a case of simple education and discussion um, to, to try and encourage behaviour change and doing things like motivational interviewing to, to try and get an agreed care plan in place whereby you, you maybe build up to try and meet patient expectations and goals and your goals as a clinician to improve um, some of the presentations associated with this condition. Screen for it and treat depression. I think depression, anxiety, lack of sleep, we know all these things have a massive impact on pain, dysfunction and quality of life. So it's really important that we don't just treat the foot or the joint and we look at that overall picture. Goal setting and motivational interviewing, as I've mentioned, and readiness for behaviour training, because it may be that um, the individual you're working with is not ready to take that on board and you need to know that, and that needs to be part of a very open and honest discussion and care plan. As well as non-pharmacological, we've got pharmacological interventions that we often see um, used in the management of osteoarthritis. So, kind of going from the most benign right through to the most kind of invasive in terms of pharmacological options. You've got topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory gels, which may for some work and for others have a fairly limited value. We then move on to your kind of first line in terms of analgesics, so things like paracetamol, although we know from the evidence that has a limited value in terms of any great management of osteoarthritis, um, and or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, plus um, or minus a proton pump inhibitor, although we know they cause some issues with um, osteoporosis, and, and so these things need to be taken into consideration. Um, glucosamine, no evidence in comparison to placebo, so there, there isn't a lot of evidence surrounding this. Um, how you're on injections are actually now not recommended. Um, opioids, if the, if the pain is progressing and becoming a more severe presentation. Um, intermittent corticosteroid injections recommended no more than three in one joint in one year. These certainly will not cure the condition, but they can sometimes help manage some of the discomfort, even for a period of time to initiate other aspects of your management plan, such as um, you know, exercise, weight loss, whatever, whatever that might look like in that patient. And medications to manage um, associated or secondary conditions, so things like gout, depression, um, lack of sleep and poor sleep hygiene, um, central pain, um, all of which can relate or contribute to some of the presentations of osteoarthritis and the pain and dysfunction that, that is associated with that. So that's some of the, the kind of main points, and, and obviously I've, I've included all my references if you want to go on and do a bit of further reading on osteoarthritis. Um, the next aspect of this discussion, we will now look at rheumatoid arthritis, and we're going to have a bit of a discussion again on what the latest evidence around this condition is telling us, and obviously we'll start to look at how this differentiates from osteoarthritis and, and why it is a different clinical entity. So, just like osteoarthritis, we're going to start by looking at what is rheumatoid arthritis. And essentially, rheumatoid arthritis is a disease of synovial tissue, which lines joints, tendon sheaths, and bursa, um, which is why <coughs> it is a disease with intra and extra articular features, and is a systemic disease which can affect um, you know, the, the entire body. It's an autoimmune disease which results in inflammation um, within synovial tissue. We've said it had articular and extra-articular manifestations, which we're going to go on and look at in a lot more detail. The disease, if it's not well controlled, is progressive and ultimately leads to joint and soft tissue damage, deformity, 
pain, loss of function, and a reduction in quality of life. It, it had significant impact on quality of life if it is not well managed. But historically it wasn't, but now, um, thanks to um, modern medicine and, and new options in terms of pharmacology, again, which we'll look at, then management of this condition is now thankfully a lot better. And due to the effects on the cardiovascular system, RA is associated with increased mortality. So it isn't just about the impacts that it had on the musculoskeletal system. We have to think wider than that in terms of rheumatoid arthritis, um, <coughs> as it can result in a reduction in terms of um, lifespan if it is not managed well. So the cause of rheumatoid arthritis, again, a bit like osteoarthritis, it is multifactorial. There is no one thing that, that causes rheumatoid arthritis. It is a number of different factors. So um, risk factors include things like sex hormones. So pre-menopausal women are three times more likely than men to develop rheumatoid arthritis. So there is a hormonal component. Genetics, there is a strong association with the HLA haplotype, human leukocyte antigen particularly the HLA DR4 and DR1, which um, code for and interact with your major histocompatibility um, complexes, which we're going to have a look at in terms of how they initiate and drive autoimmune reaction. And environmental, um, things such as smoking, thought to cause citrullination of protein, which then um, induces the production of um, citrullinated antibodies, which drive um, the underlying pathophysiology of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and then we, we go on to mention that so positive rheumatoid factor or anti citrullinated peptide antibodies, of which anti CCPs are a variant of, um, these things are thought to contribute to the formation of rheumatoid arthritis and also the severity in terms of the presentation which we'll look at. Um, what a lot of people don't realise is that smoking is every bit as linked to rheumatoid arthritis as it is to, for example, cardiovascular disease. So it's something that a lot of evidence has come out on more recently and something we need to be aware of as clinicians if we are working in and around this area of practice with this patient group. <coughs> so the signs and symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis different from osteoarthritis um, in terms of the signs, it is progressive, particularly if it's not managed early and managed well. Tends to be symmetrical, not always, but usually. Peripheral and as a polyarthritic presentation. So, as a general rule, rheumatoid arthritis presents as a bilateral symmetrical polyarthritis of the smaller joints of the hands and feet. Um, it tends to present in younger people as opposed to um, what we've just been discussing, osteoarthritis, although not everyone is a textbook case, there is variation. Severe rapid onset over several days, that can happen but it is uncommon. The presentation will present with warm, tender and swollen joints which signify synovitis, inflammation of the synovial lining. Usually not red, which is how you can differentiate it from things like septic arthritis which would be uh, a more um, red presentation with a lot of erythema in the joint. <coughs> Limited range in joints, either because of muscle guarding due to pain or because of progression of the disease um, leading to fibrosis and ankylosis of the joint. Um, so it depends on what stage that you are looking at in terms of why the, the joint range might be limited. Muscle atrophy, again, if you don't use it, you lose it. Back to that, that um, idea. And particularly if, if there's a lot of muscle guarding and or joint deformity, then the, the surrounding muscle um, structures won't be working appropriately and won't be working as effectively until you do get wasting of the surrounding muscles. And extra articular features, things like tenosynovitis, nodules, um, vasculitis, visceral complication, um, Reno's phenomenon and bursitis, and we'll look at some of those in a little bit more detail. Symptoms can vary. You have the kind of bottom 10 to 20 percent of patients who have very low disease activity and might manage quite well. You then have that cohort in the middle, um, you know, your, your, your kind of 30 
to, to 80% who have moderate relief activity and kind of have flares here and there. And then you've got your top 10 to 20% of those with very high disease activity. And we're going to look at some of the factors that contribute to that, whereby pain, stiffness, deformity, and quality of life might be severely impacted upon. As well as the small joint, bigger joint can also be affected. The IPJs, particularly the distal IPJs, are usually spared. That would be more in a presentation of some of the seronegative arthroscopies, which we'll look at in the, the next lecture. Stiffness and pain are significantly worse in the mornings due to joint gelling, obviously, and <coughs> rheumatoid arthritis. The inflammation within the synovium causes hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the synovium and the synovial fluid. And therefore, particularly um, if you are sitting still or lying in your bed overnight, you're not moving the joint. So you're not dispersing that fluid, which leads to joint gelling and joint tension. And that's why a lot of people say when they get out of bed in the morning with inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, they're in agony because there's a lot of pressure and stiffness and, and restriction in the joints, and that's called joint gelling. And that's why it takes them a while to get going which is why we asked about the symptoms of morning stiffness being over half an hour and more inflammatory presentation. A limitation of movement and impact on quality of life, absolutely. Fatigue and isolation, which again, from a biopsychosocial point of view, can perpetuate um, the significance of this condition within various individuals. So what we will largely see is um, MTPJ synovitis as podiatrists, that's the kind of hallmark of this condition. Um, I won't read all of that out, um, I'll let you read that in your own time, but that's some of the um, underlying pathophysiology associated with synovitis. Um, it can present really quite benign, so it isn't always obvious growth swelling of, of the forefoot, and sometimes it does take um, you know, a, a degree of clinical investigation, whether that be just by hands on assessment and or other assessments that we'll go on to look at to, to ascertain what's going on. Um, and some, sometimes the synovitis can be quite subclinical, which is where our imaging modalities are good, particularly that of ultrasound again, which we're going to come on and look at. But ultimately, <coughs> the main test, which has been shown to be quite sensitive in terms of detecting um, synovitis in the forefoot is the squeeze test. But if you think of other common MSK presentations like Morton's neuroma or you know, similar um, intermeticarpal mastitis, all of these things might respond positively to pain to that assessment. So um, other factors do need to be taken in and check in. <coughs> so if we look at the imaging in terms of synovitis and rheumatoid arthritis, we can see right away from the x-ray that it's different from osteoarthritis in that rather than extra proliferative bone, Rheumatoid arthritis is associated with catabolism of bone erosion, which is why at the distal aspect of that metatarsal there you can see there is almost a chunk out of the bone, and that, that is the damage associated with uncontrolled synovitis. On the left hand side of the screen we have the ultrasound image of that joint, um, and we're taking that from a dorsal longitudinal approach, and what we can see in the top image is essentially grayscale synovial hypertrophy where we can see distension of the joint capsule because of hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the underlying synovium associated with rheumatoid arthritis. That would be grade 3. And then the image below that, we switch on Doppler function to try and detect if there's any inflammation within the joint space, which there normally isn't. And we can see that more than 50% of the joint space lights up with Doppler signal. And that identifies grade 3 synovitis, which is associated with um, rheumatoid arthritis. Now the erosion, we know from the evidence and we know from clinical practice, tend to um, first appear on the kind of periarticular margin of the bone um, at the sides and we can see that from the x-ray there. The fifth metatarsal head is quite often the first um, area anatomically where we'll see these erosion. And if we think about why that is and we think back to the normal joint anatomy where hyaline cartilage covers the end of the long bone, but actually the edges are not covered by that cartilage and so are more subject to trauma and, and catabolic breakdown associated with the inflammatory component of 
the rheumatoid arthritis and that's why we see them at those margins of the joint initially. <coughs> Other features of rheumatoid arthritis, if we look out with the joint and we look at muscle atrophy and cachexia, which we call in lay terms skinny fat. So hyperactivity of the immune system in rheumatoid arthritis is a metabolically demanding process and may lead to reduced body cell mass, BCM, thus leading to rheumatoid cachexia. This is a different entity to the normal sarcopenia of ageing. Um, so as we age, sarcopenia is normal whereby we lose muscle mass, but this happens as a direct result of the um, hyperactivity of the immune system in rheumatoid arthritis. And we've already looked at that um, the evidence on if you have less lean muscle mass and how that impacts on physiology in terms of potentially having more fat cells and releasing adipokines and pro-inflammatory pro molecules which in conditions like rheumatoid arthritis is going to make the whole situation work. So coupled with pain and an inability to be as physically active, body composition in rheumatoid arthritis patients can change to one of less lean muscle mass and increased body fat. Overall weight may or may not change and thus BMI is of limited use. And there, we've just said, low lean mass is associated with more progressive disease and worse outcomes with respect to cardiovascular pathology in our age. So we've actually got evidence now that this state of rheumatoid cachexia can actually um, cause further deterioration associated with the condition itself from a cardiovascular point of view, linking back in with that outlook in terms of mortality associated with this condition. If we look at some of the extra-articular features and the medical imaging associated with those, I put up uh, an image of tenosynovitis in rheumatoid arthritis, and I have put up tibialis posterior specifically because that's what we'll see a lot as podiatrists examining the foot and ankle. Um, the synovial sheet of the tibialis posterior and flexor digitorum along this tendon in this image are inflamed, and this leads to traumatic attenuation and degeneration of the tendon. This will in turn allow more stress to be placed on the spring ligament, long and short plantar ligament, and plantar muscles and fascia of the foot. And ultimately this might eventually progress to the tail of slipping medially and plantarly off the superior aspect of the calcaneus, and the resultant valgus rear foot deformity associated with RA and tenosynovitis. If the subtalar joint itself is also involved, this may worsen or speed up the progression of hind foot deformity due to joint swelling, ligament attenuation, and bony deformity and eventual fibrosis and ankylosis. And so that explains why we get some of the, the foot pathology that we see in uncontrolled rheumatoid arthritis. And we can see from the image on the right, from the ultrasound, what that's showing essentially is tunosynovitis with a thickening of the, um, the synovial sheath around the tendon, similar to the joint, hypertrophy and hyperplasia, and significant inflammation once we put Doppler on and we see all the, the kind of red areas around that tendon. <coughs> Again, another extra-articular feature, nodules in rheumatoid arthritis, less common now because we do have better control of the disease, but associated with um, subgroups of rheumatoid arthritis patients. Nodules are associated with small vessel vasculitis and those with more severe disease presentation who are antibody positive, who smoke and with the presentation of the HLA-DR. Um, so we know, we know that smoking is associated with more severe disease progression because of the citrullination of protein and the formation of autoantibodies against that. This larger manifests in areas of mechanical stress and can also appear internally in the lung, thus potentially causing peripheral and visceral complication. They may regress or worsen in response to systemic therapy and can be surgically removed if problematic. So you can see these particularly on areas of prominence and pressure within the feet, at the dorsal aspects and at the medial and lateral peripheral borders. Um, and so it's important to, to associate what these are um, in relation to rheumatoid arthritis and how we manage those. Bursitis as well, again another extra articular component of the disease um, and particularly prevalent in the foot as it's a weight bearing area. So inflammation of anatomical bursa and formation and inflammation of adventitious bursa are common in rheumatoid arthritis. 
A study by Hooper et al. demonstrated that in osteoarthritis patients, forefoot bursa were commonly located in the medial and lateral forefoot region, but were located across all regions for rheumatoid arthritis patients. In osteoarthritis patients, reduced ankle joint range of motion predicted forefoot bursa count. In rheumatoid arthritis patients, erosion presence was related to forefoot bursa count. Um, so again, these can present anywhere um, throughout the body in relation to rheumatoid arthritis and within the foot. So that might be the plantar aspect of the metatarsal head, intermetatarsally, um, at the retrocalcaneal buffer, wherever that might be, and it can be a real source of um, pain, discomfort, and ultimately severely impact on function and quality of life, particularly if the foot is involved. <coughs> Vasculitis. Um, Again, vasculitis tends to present with more aggressive um, variations of rheumatoid arthritis and again associated with things like smoking, autoantibody formation and high features of the, the autoantibody. Um, it's usually associated um, with more severe disease and HLE class 1 and class 2 genotypes, often present in those with long-standing rheumatoid arthritis of 10 years plus. And the most common presentations are cutaneous, um, which ra ranges in terms of the severity, and that associated with the vasa nervorum, which may lead to peripheral paresthesia, often seen in the feet, so you will tend in rheumatoid arthritis to, to see nerve damage if the vasa nervorum is affected. It won't often be as severe as the presentation in diabetes, whereby there is complete neuropathy, it will be more paresthesia type presentation, but it can often be extremely painful and a source of significant discomfort. Acute presentations of vasculitis um, can include things like giant cell arteritis, and that presents as a medical emergency as vision can be lost within 24 hours, um, usually presentation around um, the temporal artery, pain, um, significant discomfort, um, throbbing headache, and that's how um, these things can present. So that's some of the signs and symptoms. In terms of how we actually diagnose RA in practice, that will usually be done um, via rheumatology. Um, the diagnosis of RA has changed. In 2010, the classification criteria was updated um, because the previous criteria did have a lot of limitations and people were being missed. Um, I won't go through this in detail. You can read this in your own time. But ultimately, the 2010 ACR and ULAR classification criteria is what we used. It was originally developed to highlight early rheumatoid arthritis suffering for participation in research, but it is now used in practice. The pathophysiology of rheumatoid arthritis is very complex, and this is by no means an absolutely exhaustive list, um, but this is just some of the main features that contribute to the pathophysiology of the inflammation underlying in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, to get to this point, we've already said that it in involves a number of different things. So we start off with genetic susceptibility um, with the HLA gene alleles and then combine that with an environmental trigger. So things like the smoking causing citrullination of arginine. Um, this led this then causes the major histocompatibility complex to interact with the adaptive immune system and that's essentially what's involved in the majority of autoimmune disease presentation. The major histocompatibility complex are essentially proteins on the surface of antigen presenting cells which um, interact with and activate the adaptive immune system to cause the underlying pathology associated with whatever the autoimmune system is, in this case, rheumatoid arthritis. So T cell activation, HLA and MHC interact with T cells by displaying antigen citrullinated protein, for example, via antigen presenting cells uh, via the major histocompatibility complex. T cells proliferate and cause secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines, so molecules that induce and perpetuate inflammation. T cells also interact with B cells to produce antibodies, and that's, for example, some of the antibodies that we see that drive rheumatoid disease and particularly drive severity. So, anti citrullinated peptide autoantibodies, rheumatoid factors, um, both of these um, are associated with um, rheumatoid arthritis. Historically, we always thought rheumatoid 
factor <coughs> was the main one, but actually anti ttp antibodies are now more specific in terms of diagnostic criteria and predicting severity within rheumatoid arthritis. B cells in turn act as antigen presenting cells to T cells. Macrophages, um, so our phagocytes, also activate and secrete many pro inflammatory cytokines, which again just drives that inflammation further. Cytokines stimulate macrophages in the turn, fibroblasts, and osteoclasts, and have an endogenous effect on the liver, which is why CRP is produced in acute inflammation. And we can see that as part of our acute phrase reactants if we do um, kind of serology and hematology blood work. They also attract and activate neutrophils which degrades cartilage. So that explains why, you know, the osteoclast proliferation, why rheumatoid arthritis has a kind of catabolic effect on bone and starts to break down bone. Um, chondrocytes activated by IL-1, another cytokine, release degradative enzymes destroying synovial joint cartilage. So that starting to demystify why we see a lot of the presentations in rheumatoid arthritis and how it affects the joint. <clears throat> so if we look at cytokines, which are a major player in terms of driving the pathophysiology of rheumatoid arthritis, if we look at those in a little bit more detail, one of the most important group mediators of rheumatoid arthritis are cytokines. The most prominent of these um, include things like TNF-alpha, IL-1 and IL-6. They have autocrine activating the same cell, paracrine activating their bi cells, and endocrine activating um, kind of distant sites effects accounting for a lot of the systemic manifestations of this disease. Um, some of the most important cytokine effects in terms of the pathophysiology of RA include induction of cytokine synthesis, so they, they all kind of interrelate and signal each other and, and promote worsening of that inflammatory process, upregulation of adhesion molecules, activation of osteoclasts, which is why we get them breakdown, Induction of other inflammatory mediators, including prostaglandins, nitric oxide, and MMP, which we've already seen earlier, are responsible, responsible for turnover. And so hyperactivity of these degrades cartilage and degrades joint structures. Induction of the acute phase response, so CRP, ESR, these things we can measure. They are non-specific, but they do tell us. Um, if there is inflammation somewhere in the body and can help with monitoring of this disease. Systemic features, um, cytokines are responsible for things like fatigue, fever, cachexia, which we spoke about earlier, and activation of B cells um, and the production of antibodies which drive this disease and drive the severity. All of these stages lead to, to synovial hyperplasia and hypertrophy and formation of a panis, and that's something you might have heard about before, where the, the synovium essentially enroaches in on the joint, um, causing further destruction and, and joint damage. And inflammation, which leads to synovitis and synovial joint destruction. So that's some of the underlying um, main pathophysiology of this condition. This is just more of a diagrammatic um, version of what we've just spoke about. So I'll let you go through that in your own time if you are a more visual learner, so that you can see where these different cells and different molecules and signaling molecules um, kind of come into play in terms of driving this disease and why we get some of the, the features um, associated with this disease that we do. The treatment of rheumatoid arthritis from a pharmacological viewpoint should support the, the treat to target principle. So we now have evidence all around treat to target in rheumatoid arthritis, similar to what we do <coughs> in other conditions like managing hypertension managing um, HbA1c levels and diabetes. We historically never had anything like that in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, but we now do, and the evidence around that is really positive for aiming for those principles. Early initiation of DMARD, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug therapy, is key to halt possession of the destructive autoimmune response we've just spoke about. The above treatment strategy was conventional DMARD progressing to biologic DMARD, with the use of bridging medications such as steroids and symptom control medications such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs is supported by sign guidelines and ULAR guidelines. Um, so that, that is the kind of mainstay of treatment of rheumatoid arthritis outlined in the diagram above. This image you probably won't be able to see clearly on this slide, but I have put this in and I put a link in the notes below I thought this was a really good image in terms of highlighting 
all of the major um, DMARD, both biologic and non, that we now have, and even some of the newer medications that are on the market, such as Janet kinase inhibitor, and molecularly and, and kind of pharmacodynamically where they act to halt the underlying um, inflammation driven um, by this disease process. So I would encourage you to have a look at that because it will tell you specifically where the drugs are. Um, what we know from the evidence is that different presentations of rheumatoid arthritis in different people are driven by different things. Um, so various cytokines, various molecules, whether that be B cells, T cells, IL-1, IL-17, whatever that might look like, it's, the inflammation is driven slightly differently in every individual, which is why some people respond very well to certain drugs and why some people don't. And so it can be a case of um, working through the guidelines potentially to try different drugs to get the inflammation under control for that specific individual. If we look at the podiatric management of RA, it's a bit like the medical management. We now realise that um, more aggressive intervention earlier is what's going to be key to prevent joint damage, destruction, and the, the traditional um, presentation that we used to see with rheumatoid arthritis more severely, such as joint destruction, um, fibrosis, ankylosis, um, tendon dysfunction, whatever that might look like. <coughs> so, the same guidelines recognise the importance of multidisciplinary input for this patient group, including podiatry, as do the BSR guidelines, which suggest that um, patients with a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis should be seen within about three months, 12 weeks, by the, the multidisciplinary AHP team. We know from the evidence that semi-rigid orthotics are beneficial in rheumatoid arthritis. Bespoke orthotics show no superiority as yet. Rocker style shoes may be beneficial, which makes sense. This is largely a disease of the forefoot. And so obviously if we consider things like a rocker bottom shoe, which moves ground reaction form more proximally and will take peak ground reaction form to more proximal to the metatarsal head, that's why it will all offload some of the biomechanical stress factors which can perpetuate and cause pain in this condition. Use of ultrasound for diagnosis and injection, we spoke about that earlier, ultrasound can be very, very good for differentiating between inflammatory and non-inflammatory pathology and can be very good at identifying subclinical synovitis when clinically the disease seems to be well under control but potentially there's ongoing pain. So it's looking at whether that's due to some of the more chronic presentations of pain and central sensitization or another peripheral presentation out with rheumatoid arthritis or whether it's due to subclinical synovitis that ultrasound imaging or such like may help you pick up. And you might also consider as podiatrists or as healthcare professionals referral on for surgery, whatever that might look like in terms of the presentation. And that would be a case of liaison with orthopaedics and rheumatology to discuss the need to cease DMARD therapy, um, more so if it's a biologic. Conventional DMARD um, tend to be okay to keep patients on these when they go for surgery, depending on um, the individual, um, as it's not just about um, the DMARD itself and the immunosuppression that that causes. Um, the disease itself is immunosuppressive and uncontrolled inflammation may also lead to increased infection risks and obviously flares and pain and poor quality of life. So it's about getting that balance if surgery is considered. What we also need to do as podiatrists and as rheumatologists or anybody involved in the management of this condition is monitor the, the rheumatoid arthritis and this is usually done in various ways. Obviously clinical signs and symptoms are paramount and that's what you're going to go by um, but specifically done via the DAS28, um, either the DAS28 CRP or the DAS28 ESR version. The difficulty is that the DAS28 CRP is usually lower than the DAS28 ESR. That's because ESR is associated with clot formation and fibrinogen and, and blood thickness, so that will tend to persist longer at higher levels, whereas CRP is, is usually high in the very acute phase of inflammation. Um, as such, reliance on only DAS28 CRP may underestimate the percentage of those with high disease activity, um, so it's important to consider that. DAS28 also does not include disease activity within the ankles and feet, and that can be quite a challenge um, from a podiatrist's point of view in the sense that the patient could be considered as having low disease activity 
and considered as well managed when actually they can have one, two, three, four, five joints in the foot and ankle or more that are inflamed and displaying signs of synovitis or the, the extra articular features of inflammation, tenosynovitis, nodules, whatever that might look like. Um, and so quite often disease activity in the foot can really influence um, treatment and management strategies. <coughs> this is a diagrammatic version of what the DAF looks like on the left. Um, and ultimately, it, it's usually done via a computer. You input the data and it will give you a result. And on the right hand side is the results in terms of um, what they mean. Um, and that's ranging from high disease activity down to remission, which is the target that we spoke about in terms of treat to target. The treat to target is a DAF score of 2.6 or less, which indicates remission. But again, remember, this does not consider the, the foot and ankle. Um, in patients with very high disease activity, those ones that we spoke about in terms of um, HLA, gene allele present, um, antibody production, um, anti-CCP presentation, the, the target for those presentations might just be that of low disease activity if remission really is not feasible. That is ultimately a, a recap of rheumatoid arthritis, and again, I've put my references up if you would like to read further detail on that, but hopefully throughout that discussion we've kind of highlighted some of the new evidence and the main evidence surrounding the pathophysiology and the management of both osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, um, and you certainly feel free to have a look at those um, references in more detail if you so wish.